Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your word. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Seal to our hearts that which is truth. Filter out all of that which is not of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we stopped somewhere around verse 14, I believe, or, or verse 12 of chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. There is a... Uh, a metaphysical uh, something going on here in the text that I hope to explain. Uh, I may go about this in a roundabout way, uh, but I do hope to deal with the text, each verse, uh, as we go through uh, to, uh, to the end of the 10th chapter. Uh, I haven't always done this. I haven't always actually gone verse by verse, but I'd like to try to do that in this video uh, and at least comment on each verse and then, and then try and come back and then give somewhat of a summary or a conclusion as to what I believe uh, the message is that the Holy Spirit's trying to convey in this uh, section of, of the 10th chapter or the 10th chapter of, of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we began at verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would, I would not that you should be ignorant uh, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The cloud there, I believe, is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the sea is... Uh, uh, a beautiful picture, I believe, of Israel's deliverance. Uh, so we're looking at the Holy Spirit and we're looking at deliverance. And this was God's people, Israel. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Now, we, we, it would really do us well to stop and pause a little bit with these verses and give them a little bit of thought. They all drank, uh, or they did, they did all eat of the same spiritual meat. Uh, my thoughts when I read that verse is that there are many believers today who are, who are uh, not aware of the fact that we all eat of the same spiritual meat. We all feast on the same thing. Not many things as uh, would, uh, uh, and I know I may be jumping ahead a little bit here, but not not many things, all kinds of things, different, uh, you know, a smorgasbord of things that we actually will go on and see in the text that this is what the, uh, the devils do. Uh, uh, the table of, de of devils. Uh, we have a communion, and that communion is with uh, the blood of Christ, uh, as we also see the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We feast on the Word, Christ. Christ is the Word. We, feed, we come here and we feast upon Christ. We don't feast upon our own ideas, our own uh, uh, logic, our own uh, assumptions about how things ought to be, but we feast on Christ. And feasting on Christ is, is something that's in direct contrast to uh, just feasting on anything but the Word of God. The, the, the emphasis here is very heavy on the fact that we feast upon God's Word. It was God's Word in the wilderness uh, with Israel that uh, guided them, directed them. Uh, the whole uh, basis of God's argument as far as Israel is concerned was, was that they didn't uh, trust Him, they didn't obey Him, they didn't follow Him, uh, 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 except without some degree of reluctance. Uh, many, many of them wanted to return to Egypt, 
you know, uh, uh, mom says, Dad, we got to take the kids back to Egypt. They, they, they were doing really great there, you know, and in, in, in kindergarten and, 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 you know, educational wise, work wise. Uh, now, I understand that they were slaves to Egypt, but they had it a lot better, at least in their minds, they had it better where that they were, where the, the place that they were delivered from or out of, uh, things were just a little bit better uh, than in the desert. And I, I pointed out how that we are, all, every one of us are passing through our own spiritual desert. So they did all eat of the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. And they, that's, uh, to me, that is a, a beautiful illustration of the Word of God. Uh, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. We know that the rock is Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. And I pointed out the fact, I believe, that many is referring to God's people. Uh, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, if you want to make that death, God killed them in the wilderness. Uh, I suppose that you, you have a good argument for that. I don't believe that that's exactly what the text is saying. But they were overthrown in the wilderness in the spiritual sense that they didn't trust God, they didn't believe God. And now these things were our examples, verse 6. They were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted to lust after evil things. And I pointed out that if we just simply look at that in the moral sense and not the spiritual sense, uh, we make a mistake because uh, I think there's every, every reason in the world to believe that lusting after evil things also has an ecclesiastical context. You can lust after evil things in the Christian sense, the spiritual sense, the church sense, uh, as far as doctrine is concerned, uh, I believe that is God's primary concern here is His Word, doctrine, faith, trust, and they lusted after evil things. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, talk a little bit more about what I believe uh, this idolatry can be. Uh, many Christians uh, are aware of the fact that idolatry in the strictest sense is, is anything that takes the place of God in our lives. It doesn't have to be a stone statue of Buddha or, or, or I, I don't know, you name it. Uh, it doesn't have to be an actual physical uh, idol. It can be... Uh, uh, just a whole lot of things. Anything that, that takes our attention away from the person and the work of Christ or that our, our emphasis is, is on that thing, our, our desire is wrapped up in that thing, it's the motivator, it's the driving force behind our lives, our relationship, our walk with Christ and one another. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, uh, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And I talked a, bit, a little bit about that. The, uh, neither let us commit fornication. And I talked a little bit about that. There's a spiritual fornication. We've been espoused to Christ. Uh, and yet we continue to have, in many cases, a, an endless flirtatious affair with the law. And the contrast here is between Israel and the church. You need to understand here as we're going through the text, and to keep this in context here, we need to take at least make a mental note of just how different the church is today from Israel in the wilderness. There's many similarities, but there's also some striking differences. We're not under law, but we're under grace, and we're going to see that uh, pop its pop its head up in the text here in a very dynamic way here in just a very few short verses. And fell in one day three and twenty thousand, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. And I suggested to tempt Christ is, is to simply uh, not take God at his word, to, to not trust God that what he said is true, uh, to go beyond what is written, to look beyond the word, uh, which is the you know we've been 
Jesus prayed that, that, that we, that, to the Father, that He sanctify us in truth. Thy word is truth. And so they were destroyed of serpents. Now, does that mean that we're going to be literally destroyed of serpents by not trusting God? No, I don't believe the text is saying that at all. Uh, it's, I believe this is a, in the figurative sense that we can be destroyed of serpents. Just as we can be overthrown in the wilderness, in our wilderness. We can come to the point in our lives to where that we're not trusting God and what He has said is true. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed by the destroyer. And that is, I, I pointed out, I thought that, that there's every reason to believe that that's the angel of death that we see at the first Passover. Now, that's interesting because the first Passover is a heavy lesson uh, for us concerning what Christ did. Uh, I've pointed this out in numerous, numerous videos, how that the sun had nothing to do with the blood being put over the doorpost. Now all these things happened unto them for examples and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And I mentioned in the last video, I believe that uh, without a doubt that we are in that last age. We've, we've been in that age uh, since this was written. Uh, we're living in the final days, the last days. The last days is a phrase that could very accurately describe the past, just about the past 2,000 years. There's not going to be another age and, uh, except the kingdom, which follows the tribulation period. This is the final age, uh, the church age. And that brings us to verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. And that tend to, tends to scare a lot of Christians. Uh, well, I just don't know if I'm going to stand. Uh, I should be standing, and, and I may not. And therefore, I need to take heed lest I fall. And, and we, there's a lot of questions that Christians should ask them, themselves about that verse. What does it mean to fall? Uh, to take, what does it mean to stand? Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth. That is, this is a person, and I believe, and I'm not asking anyone to agree with me, but I'm, I, as I read the text, I'm looking at a Christian who thinks that he's standing, and that by his own strength. We, our standing is before God alone. We have no standing before God in and of ourselves. We've been made to stand in Christ. Christ is our standing. We, we don't stand alone in our own strength. Take heed lest he fall. That is through disbelief for, or unbelief. That is the fall, is unbelief. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. There hath no temptation uh, taken you, but such is common to man. In other words, your test is not unique. Every single Christian that's ever lived has gone through those same trials, testings, uh, temptations, uh, because it, it deals, it's dealing with the subject of faith and trusting God in all of our circumstances. Who will not suffer you, that is allow or permit you, is what the, the actual Greek word means, to be tempted above that ye are able. So that word able tells me that that ability exists someplace. And we're going to see, I believe, we're going to see that that, that ability is, is entirely uh, connected to, wrapped up with uh, God's Word. But will with the temptation. That's with the temptation. In other words, as it's happening, and that can only be the Word of God, also make a way to escape. The word there is the, the, means the successful way out, uh, which also goes on to what is new and desirable. That is the Lord's outcome. And so he makes the, a way of escape. And that way of escape, I believe, is this book, which we call the Word of God. 
that you may be able to bear it. And that's how we're able to bear it. And the word bear it is the word that means, literally means carried safely away from danger. Uh, I want to take a moment to read Colossians 3. If I get you to turn to Colossians 3, we're looking at chapter 3, verse 1. I want to read verses 1 through 10 very quickly. If you have the King James Version, uh, you'll notice that the, the, uh, the, they highlight the, this subject. They, they give it a subtitle, that section, and it's, you'll see it probably in your text. Put on the new self, the new self. It's a putting on of the new self. It's a changing of garments, okay? And, that, and we know that we have put on Christ. It's not that we need to put on Christ as much as it is we need to realize that we have put off the old man and we have put on the new man. So I wanna read this very quickly. If you then, and that's a first class condition, if you then be risen with Christ, which you are, seek those things which are above. Now automatically our minds snap to streets of gold and I don't know what, whatever else, you know, lovely waterfalls and beautiful flower gardens and whatever else that's in heaven. I don't think that's what that's talking about at all. Uh, not the, the beauty of heaven. What it's talking about is the finished work of Christ. We're to seek those things which are above where Christ sits, sitteth on the right hand of God. His work is complete. There's nothing to be added to what Christ did. Set your affection on things above, that's on Christ. Not on things on the earth, that would be yourself. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. Well, I could have swore I'm alive, I'm here talking to you on video. What does that mean that I've died? Well, of course it means that I've died to sin, self, the world, Satan, and even death itself. When Christ was crucified, I was crucified with him. I was buried with him, raised with him to walk in newness of life, not in oldness of the letter, which is law, which is what we're, is being contrasted here with uh, the church in Israel. Yes, what Israel went through was an example for us, but they were under law, not grace. We are under grace, not law. And that's an important uh, factor to consider in all of this. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life, folks, is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I can't think of any words that would be more comforting to read than this, especially if you're a believer struggling to, to uh, accept the fact that you that God will never leave you nor forsake you, that, that you're His, that you belong to Him forever. You will appear with, uh, with Him in glory. Uh, therefore, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And here we go. Now we're back under law. Right? No. If you want to think that mortifying your members which are upon the earth, which are fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, okay, it, it says that, that this, this, this is idolatry. If you want to look at that as, well, now we're being given an instruction on, on, on how that we need to clean up the old man, then uh, we've derailed, okay? Our mind has completely derailed from the whole area, we've, we've left the area of, of grace, and now we've put ourselves back under law. That's not what that's talking about at all. How do we mortify our members which are upon the earth? By realizing that we have died to sin, self, and the law. Sin shall not have dominion over us because, why? Because we're not under law or under grace. So, idolatry. It just mentions that right here. Now, I, I hate to jump, jump you again, but what I want to do is I want to pause right there uh, before we go on with the verse 6 of Colossians chapter 3 here. And, uh, and uh, 
I want us to, to think about this idolatry for a moment. Idolatry. Folks, uh, just about anything in our lives can be an idol. Anything that would distract us, take our attention, remove our attention away from the uh, absolute doctrinal principles of life and growth in Christ. Uh, anything that takes and removes our attention from the person and the work of Christ or that our attention now becomes uh, one in which uh, we, we have to appease some angry God that we're to try to clean up the flesh in order to be pleasing to God. Uh, that is not true. We have been accepted in the Beloved and God has nothing against us. We're not under law. We're under grace. And it is under grace that we are to mortify, put to death. The word means to put to death, okay? Therefore, our members, which are upon the earth. And, and the, the, the truth is, is that they have been put to death. What the text is telling us to do is to recognize the fact that we have died with Christ, we've been buried with Him, raised with Him to walk in newness of life, His life, okay? Uh, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, this is not us. We're not children of disobedience. There's not one Christian that ever becomes a child of disobedience, okay? in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. This is how we formerly lived. But now ye also put off all of these. And there's a lot, okay? So anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another. That's a lot. There's a lot of stuff here, and even more to do. It, it, if we look at that as cleaning up the flesh, cleaning up the old man, getting our lives, straightening out our own lives, basically in a very real sense, saving ourselves, delivering ourselves, being our own savior, our own uh, rescuer, our own deliverer, uh, then we've gone off track. Uh, how do we, how do we, uh, put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. How do we not lie uh, one to another? Well, seeing that you have you have put off the old man with his deeds. Seeing, seeing a realization of, of actually knowing in experience that we have put off the old man with his deeds. We put that old man off. We are not our old man. For a new creation in Christ Jesus, and, and the old man, God has nothing to do with the old man. The flesh profits nothing. Verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We have been made a new creation in Christ. Now, don't, don't make the mistake of believing that the new man is Christ. The new man is not Christ. Christ is Christ. The new man is the new man. Uh, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. But that new man is sinless, and we saw that when we studied through 1 John. His seed abides in us, and we cannot sin because we've been born of God. You know, our idol worship is trusting in anything but the Word of God. And that's what we need to, to always continually be on guard against is trusting in something, anything other than the Word of God. Now, if we continue on in verse 14, wherefore, my dearly beloved, uh, flee from idolatry. And I don't know if I'm jumping ahead again here. Uh, that would be verse 14. Flee from idolatry. Run from it. 
Okay, run from anything that would take the place of God's word in your life. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Folks, what did Christ's blood do in your life? You know, uh, it's a very, very sensitive subject here when we go to talking about the blood of Christ that was shed for you and me. Uh, it's, it's, we're almost walking on sacred, well, we are walking on sacred ground here, okay? The communion of the blood of Christ. This is something that we all share. An understanding and a realization of just exactly what the blood of Christ accomplished in our lives. And this is what we share in common. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. One bread. You know, when we talk about unity, you know, I've, I've seen videos, you know, or I've, I've heard messages from other pastors where they talk about how we need unity in the church today. The church is, is too divisive, and there's this striving toward a global unity as, as it concerns eucumenical things or ecclesiastical things. You know, the, the unity's not there, and it's lacking, and we need to pursue that and secure that by all means. And folks, that's just not true. Uh, unity is not something that we, uh, just like many other things, it's not something that we that we come to secure on, uh, through our own self-efforts somehow. Somehow we can just, you know, if we work hard enough, if we labor hard enough, you know, we can all be in, in unity with one another. Uh, uh, we are one in Christ. That's a passive voice. We didn't make ourselves one in Christ, okay? Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Well, of course they are. And so, so should we. We should be partakers of, the, of that which comes about as a result of our understanding the effectiveness of the person and the work of Christ in our lives. What say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? And, and we saw previously that how Paul pointed out that it's, the idol is nothing, okay? We know that there's only one God. Uh, all of these uh, idols are, are not, well, they're just that. They're idols. They're, they're, uh, I wish I had a better description of an idol as far as how a Christian should look at an idol, but I'm, I'm afraid I just I don't. Because it covers such a, a vast area of territory. I mean, just about anything can be an idol. It's, it's, uh, and I know it may be hard to accept uh, by, by many people that, that perhaps that what they are actually worshiping is an idol. But, uh, you know, let's say if I had a statue of Buddha here or a, or the Guadalupe, or you know, or some, uh, I don't know, uh, you, you name it, some little statue of some, some other religious god right here on the table, right here. Well, that would obviously be an idol, and that's that's not hard to see. You know, it's most Christians would wouldn't have difficulty understanding and looking at that and seeing that that's an idol. Okay, it's a little more difficult to understand that that. Uh, our, our sacrifice of ourself toward God and, and this whole idea of, of a, the Christian life being something that's based on human merit. It's this world religious system that's based on human merit where that we have to, to, to earn God's acceptance. We have to earn God's forgiveness. We have to somehow, somehow we have to not just earn that, but we have to maintain that. 
<clears throat> excuse me, we have to not just attain to that, but we have to maintain that. And we have to do that in our own strength, and even our own strength can become a, an idol. Because that's what we worship. We worship our own ability. We worship our own opportunities. We worship our own uh, uh, talents and our own skills, and we rely on our own faithfulness. And we, you know, we ourselves can become an idol, which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty interesting, considering the fact that we we were crucified with Christ. The things which the Gentiles uh, sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Fellowship is in view here. You want to have fellowship with other believers, but you can't always do that because they're having fellowship with devils. Okay. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of, of the devils. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils, okay? The table of devils, folks. I just, you know, in my mind's eye, I kind of picture, you know, a lot of demons sitting around the table, and they're not, they're not, they're not feasting. They're not having communion like, you know, we, you know, the famous painting, you know, of all the, the apostles, uh, you know, with Christ and the Last Supper, you know, and the, you know, where they're feasting on Him, His body, His blood. They're, you know, they're having the, la the communion together and it's all about Christ and what He's done and that's not what we see at the table of demons. It's anything, everything other than that, okay? It's, you know, you know, there's a place called Golden Corral. I haven't been there in a long time. It's a place that many of you are probably familiar with the place. You can go there, you can eat, and it's, they got a great big smorgasbord, you know, buffet, it's a great big buffet. You can eat just about anything you want, and, and I guess as much as you want, you know, for just X amount of dollars, you can go in there and you can, you know, just it's all you can eat buffet, and, and they got a lot of different things, and you, you're just eating anything and everything, and and that's what these demons are doing, and that's what Christians who are in fellowship with they are actually fellowshipping with demons when they feast on anything and everything and everything other than the person in the work of Jesus Christ because that's what our context is 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 presenting to us as that which that's what we feast upon the, the that rock that followed them was Christ okay Christ is the word do we provoke the lord to jealousy are we stronger than he and uh, well, you know, jealousy. Uh, we always tend to think of jealousy in the bad sense. You know, it's not good to be jealous. Jealous is jealous is jealous, and jealous is not a good thing. But there is a. Uh, that's not exactly true. Uh, when it comes to God. Uh, now, if you have that King James Version, it's, or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, jealously? Uh, I like the way the New, New American Standard Version presents it. Uh, or do you think that the Scripture says to no purpose, He jealously desires the Spirit whom He's made to dwell in us? If you are a Christian, you're not feasting upon Christ and His Word. If you're just here, there, tossed to and fro every wind of doctrine, okay? And you're not settled in the faith. And you're not growing in the faith. And, the, and that is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Knowing that, that Jesus Christ is the one that is faithful in your life and that you stand before God based upon the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, not your own faith, not your own strength, not your own ability, uh... If you're not doing that, if you you are one of God's children and you are you you have left that that path that He's He's set you on to walk that that path of faith and trust in Him, where that He's the one that we trust in, not ourselves, because we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the the excellency of the power may be of God and not ourselves. 
we don't have confidence in ourselves you know we should know that Christians should know that uh, these verses are on, are not hidden off in some dark corner of the Bible someplace God jealously desires the spirit of whom he's made to dwell in us does it make you feel the least bit good that God is jealous of 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 you I mean he's je he's he, he or maybe I didn't say that right he's jealous for us I mean if you had a spouse and, and uh, uh, your spouse uh, you know uh, someone else was 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 trying to take your spouse or having an affair with your spouse wouldn't you be jealous well of course you would no uh, to be a spouse to Christ while having an endless flirtatious affair with the law I've said this so many times is provokes God to jealousy you can't do both you can't you can't uh, uh, well when it comes to fellowship And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Okay? You can't be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. It's, there's got to be consistency here, folks, you know, in all this. Consistency when it comes to the Word of God. Nothing contradicts itself. Consistency in how we interpret these passages. One one verse doesn't contradict another. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy or are we stronger than He? You know that word jealousy, the first time you see that really in, in Paul's epistles this is in Romans chapter 10. You know, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. He says this of Israel. I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. That jealousy, that's the word there is, is, uh, is a parazelu. Uh, it's a compound word, that, the prefix, the para is close beside, is what it means, like a parachute, you know, it's close beside, alongside. Uh, the, uh, the zelu means to boil over with desire. It's a, properly to apply heavy, hot pressure to provoke change, especially in an up-close and personal way. You know, note the force of para, okay? Uh, this is the word for jealousy. It's, it's uh, I make jealous, I provoke to jealousy, I provoke to anger, okay? Now, God's not angry with you, He never will be. Now, it's a, it's a misconception on the part of most Christians. God is never this not only is he not angry with you folks he's never disappointed in you and you know to be di for us to be disappointed in ourselves is to have believed in ourselves god has nothing against us but you've got you've got two individuals here one is he thinks he's standing in his own strength uh, he has god's word uh, he's been given it uh, it's not that it's missing in his life. He has God's word to escape from that, from that trial of faith. And that's exactly what it is. It's a trial of faith. It's where your faith is being tested uh, concerning that uh, standing in your own strength or, or standing in his strength, not your own strength. Uh, but you're looking at someone, folks, that doesn't really comprehend, doesn't fully understand the communion of the body of Christ that what we celebrate or what we commemorate when we get together and we have communion and we share in that cup you know the blessing his blood his body that was broken for us this is why we read in that passage that concerning the taking of communion that if we drink unworthily we drink condemnation to ourselves. Why? Because we don't 
we're doing it, we're taking communion without realizing just exactly what we're commemorating. Uh, I don't know how to put it any simpler than to just give you a simple illustration. I take, I take communion, I take of, of the wine, the cup, the, the bread, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm celebrating his death until he comes. But I don't truly understand, I don't really truly comprehend just exactly what his death did for me. His sacrifice, you know, his, his sacrifice of his time, his energy, his, his resources and everything was, was, was of, it was of self, it wasn't of God, and it's not to God, that sacrifice is not to God, but it's to devils. Devils, which are, you know, it's, uh, we read about the doctrine of devils, okay? Uh, you can't separate doctrine from what we're looking at here. You can't separate the Word of God from what we're looking at here. You can't separate trusting and depending upon the God who who's gave His Word to us. You can't separate that from what's going on here. You can't separate sheep and goats, okay? Uh, from There was a mixed multitude that came out of, out of Egypt. But God knows those who, who are His, and we're going to see in the text that just that God is faithful. And that ought to comfort every one of you. But His fellowship is with devils, not the body of Christ. That's where His fellowship is. It's not where His life is, but that's where His fellowship is. It's what He has in common with. He has in common with them. Uh, so the effectiveness of Christ's blood, His body that was broken for us, all of that is unrealized. He's not feasting on the Word of God. He's not feasting on Jesus Christ. He's not coming to this book looking at what Christ has done for him and, and just glorying in, in the fact that, in, in fact, glorying in, in Christ, boasting in Christ. His bo Christ, that's his boast. That's his glory. That's his praise. That's his honor. That's his worship. Everything, his whole entire attention, his focus is on things above, not on things below. It's on Christ, not self. It's on grace, not law. But now there's another one, another individual here. He knows that he doesn't have any standing before God in himself. He's put on the, the full armor of God, which is Christ, by the way. If you want to go back and read the full armor of God, most Christians are aware of the armor of God. Okay. If you want to go and, and read back through that, what, you're gonna, what you really see when you, when you look at that is that what we're actually putting on is Christ. Just as the text, as Paul says elsewhere. So he knows he doesn't have any standing before God in himself. He's come to realize that. He's come to the end of himself. And that usually by trials, hardships, circumstances, which have, has driven that Christian to come to a point of not trusting in themselves, but in God. Because they realize how futile that is to trust in themselves. So he trusts in God, not himself. He understands his position in the body of Christ. He presents himself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is his reasonable service. It's not, it's not unreasonable, it's reasonable given what Christ has done for us. He understands the meaning of and the purpose for communion. He has no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That doesn't mean he doesn't sin. He knows how that, that that sin is relegated to the cross where it belongs. Romans 6, 11, reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. But he doesn't feast on everything under the blazing sun with demons, okay? That's what he doesn't do. His whole nourishment, he, he realizes that his nourishment is this book. It's not in this person's idea, this person's sermon, this guy following this guy, following Blessed Hope Forever, following this church, that church, or the other church, or this person, this pastor, or this other teacher, or, or, or whoever. Okay, it's this book. I don't teach you anything. Okay? 
Well, now, now maybe that's not a d directly true statement. I mean, I teach, but I do not enlighten you to understand the truth that I teach. But I don't do that. The Holy Spirit does that. He must do that. If He doesn't do that, I can't. Okay? I can't open your eyes to understand anything. Okay? Here. We can't, we can't do that. Uh, but we don't feast on everything. We're not at that, that table with the demons just feasting on everything, anything other than Jesus Christ. Whether it's, a, it's some program in the church, whether it's some, you know, uh, I don't know, you could list a lot of things that Christians are involved in. If Christ is not, and what He's done for us, folks, is not the motivating factor behind it all, if that's not why we love Him, serve Him, and everything, if, you, if we're serving Him, loving Him, trying to serve Him out of fear, then well, you know, we're still back in Egypt. We're not even we're not even in the desert with the Israelites. This person feasts on the person and the work of Jesus Christ alone. You know, we can go on with this, uh, this text all the way to the end of the chapter. Uh, we, we run literally from these things, folks. We flee from idolatry. You know, most Christians would say, oh, I, you know, they would think that's far, so far removed from a possibility in their lives that they would ever be involved in some idol, worship of some idol. You've got to understand how God views idolatry. There is idolatry going on in the Christian church today. And basically it amounts to the worship of self. Okay, The whole entire uh, focus is on what we must do for God, not what God's done for us. The motivating, the driving factor in my life, I can tell you, is not what I must do for God. Isn't it? No, no real motivation there. You know, everything that I do, I do because of what Christ has done for me. It's amazing what love can do in a person's life. If you truly love the Lord, you really want to serve Him. If you're afraid of the Lord, you're going to be reluctant to do that. So we come to the verse 23, which is a very powerful verse. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are not profitable. All things are lawful for me. You know, it seemed like it would have made much more sense if it said all, uh, all things are unlawful for me. Or a lot of things are unlawful for me. A lot of things are unlawful for me. Not what it says. Uh, or how about some things are, are, are lawful for me. Not what it says. And one of the problems I think that many Christians face, you know, we all as Christians face, is literally just taking God at His word, face value, okay? He says all things are lawful, but no. What we want to say is that cannot possibly be true. It can't possibly be true that all things are... Are you saying that robbing a bank is lawful? Are you saying that, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, just... Cheating on my income tax, is, is that lawful? Folks, let me explain something here. You as a new creation in Christ who've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, you, you, that belie a believer in Jesus Christ who is not under law but under grace, who's been justified, made righteous in the, in, in the very righteousness of God, bestowed upon you. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You have an, a sinless new man, a sinless new nature who cannot sin because his seed, Christ's seed abides in you and you, can, and you cannot sin. You can't improve upon the new man. Please, please try to follow me here. You can't improve upon the very being made... I, if I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, if I stand before God as fully righteous as Christ because that's how the Father looks at me, you can't improve upon that. I can't improve upon that. You cannot improve upon perfection. Okay? 
Not, I'm talking about the new man, not the old man. The old man is the old man, but not the new man. Created in righteousness and true holiness. That's, that's, that's what you are, okay? And you can't improve upon that. What good does law serve in your life? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't serve any purpose at all. The law is not made for a righteous man. And that's what you are. Of course all things are lawful. They, they can't be. If there was one thing that was unlawful, it, it wouldn't make sense. Because now, what, how, where do you apply that one thing? To the old man? You can't apply it to the old. You can't apply it to the new. It must be this way. It has to be this way. You can't have it any other way. If we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, and we, you can't improve upon a sinless new man, and the law serves no purpose in the believer's life, then all things must be lawful, which leads us into an area in which we function out of that new man, and now we are looking at things that are a matter of conscience, which is exactly what we see in the text. Conscience. We're looking at liberty, freedom, and conscience. But folks, there are two extremes in the Christian life that you want to avoid. One is licentiousness, and the other is legalism. Two extremes. And you see that actually, it's, you may, you may, it may just be in the white spaces here for me as I'm seeing this. But I see this in the text as I go through this. Why? Because it, every, it's all tied together with every bit of this. Liberty, conscience, you know, the new man. Having put on the new man. Not provoking God to jealousy. You know, living, being under grace, living under law. Uh, and then we're told, let no man seek his own, but every man another's. Wealth is what the King James says. I believe this is the King James Version that says that. Uh, the word wealth is in italics. It's not there. Uh, let no man seek his own, but every man another's. And others things. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I hate I you, using names of, of any anybody or at any time. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's will. Well, what if me Elon Musk had, had done that? Well, he probably wouldn't be the richest guy on the planet. Now I understand the word wealth isn't there, but the point I'm trying to make here is that, it, that that is a statement that goes absolutely contrary to everything we, we, we feel as human beings, okay? It's, it's me first. It's got to be me first. I'm first, okay? I've got to take care of myself first. It's me first, okay? Isn't it interesting how the Lord reverses that and puts others before ourselves here? Let no man seek his own, but every, every, man's, uh, every, every man another man's. Whatsoever soul in the shambles that eat, asking no question for a conscience sake. It's all about our conscience. It's all about wounding the conscience of another brother. It, when, I, when I'm talking about legalism and, and, and licentiousness and legalism being the two extremes here, okay, you can see which one's at work when, when we look at, at the brother who causes his brother to stumble okay, causes his conscience to be defiled because he's expecting something of his, of his brother that he shouldn't. Uh, if, if, if I expect something of you that I shouldn't, now we're looking at law, okay? If, if I just throw my hands up in the air and say, well, I'm, I'm free in Christ, uh, uh, I'm not under law, I have, I have total freedom, perfect freedom, all things are lawful for me, okay, so I can do whatever I want, doesn't matter what my, what my brother thinks, feels, how it affects him, I'm going to do it because I'm free, that's not how we live either. So those two extremes, licentiousness and legalism, are both at work in our lives, not just here in this passage, but in other passages as well. 
It's the two extremes that we want to avoid. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that uh, for which I give thanks? Wherefore, therefore, you, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. What causes a, a believer to not seek his own profit? Well, one who's, who's come to settle on the fact that he's been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenlies. He's not really seeking to gain anything. He already has everything. I mean, he's been enriched. He's been blessed so abundantly in Christ. Uh, he, he's God truly, uh, he understands God, how, how much God loves him and, and that God will never leave him nor forsake him. Uh, he's, he's in a very comfortable place of rest and trust. Uh, you don't think it's too, di I mean, you wouldn't think it would be too difficult for him to actually care about others, would you? If, if he feels like his own position in, in Christ is secure, if he feels like his own relationship with God is on track, if he's not really in need of anything, I'm talking spiritually, okay? We all have physical needs. But spiritually, he's not lacking any. The, the text told us early on that we're not lacking coming behind in any spiritual grace. That's what the text said, okay? Do we understand that? Do we know that? Do we trust God concerning that? Do we enjoy knowing that? Do we enjoy that blessing? Well, maybe we will and maybe we won't. But we don't seek our own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Saved is the last word in chapter 10. Deliverance, deliverance, rescue, deliverance. Deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. Okay? Six things. Okay? Sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. These are the things that we are saved from, delivered from. We as God's redeemed people, we are redeemed in order to be saved. That verse is not talking about showing, it's not, it's, we're not looking at Paul's desire that others be redeemed. That's not what we're looking at. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of God's people, the many that they, God's people, who, whom He has redeemed, may be saved. Delivered. Delivered from what? From sin. Self. The law. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Uh, so we're delivered from sin. We're delivered from whatsoever is not of faith, which is was basically the problem that we the, that the Israelites had in in the desert just as the church today has the church today is in a desert in a very real sense the church at large in the main in the main mainstream Christianity as a whole is in the wilderness not trusting God not feasting upon God's word but just about every other thing but that Anything but that. Well, look, I'm out of time. We're, I don't know if we're done with chapter 10. Uh, let me know in the comments how, how you feel about that. I, I want to take a moment to thank everyone that comments on these videos. I read every comment. I thank you very, very much for those comments. They, they keep me encouraged. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.